Christians that are very, very confused, very sad, may I say. And uh, I'm sad that they are sad. Why am I saying that? Look, there's a lot of hardships that surrounds all of us all around the world. In fact, we have not even seen the beginning of it. I mean, what is it that we had? You know, I've, uh, I was in Amsterdam and they closed the restaurants at 8 p.m. and everybody were angry. Hungry and angry. And I'm thinking to myself, this is it. You can't have a steak outside after 8 p.m. Water persecution. <laughs> and I'm... You know, after having not only gone through the entire book of Revelation for the sake of writing a book of it, but after having the burden to teach on it, um, starting from next year, um, I realized people really have no idea <laughs> the things that are going to come upon this world. But then, many are still walking as believers today, they go to church, they think they know Jesus, they think they follow Jesus. But then you look at them and they're angry and they're sad. And online they're vicious and they're not kind. They love sensationalism and if you don't follow that same narrative, they cancel you and execute you uh, or at least your character. And it reminds me of the need of all of us to know the word of God in order to be in this world, not to be of this world, and certainly not to be sad when we know that our Redeemer lives. No, the whole world is looking at us. What kind of example can we give if we ourselves are more anxious than they are. In Luke 24, but before we go, let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. Your word is true. And I ask now that you will sanctify us by that truth. We do not want to hear from an individual. We want to hear from you today. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the hope that we have in your word and in your promises. In Jesus' name, amen. So in Luke 24... Now behold, two of the disciples were traveling that same day to a village called Emmaus. That was Sunday morning, already at daytime. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. So it was... While they conversed and reasoned, they conversed and reasoned. It's interesting, they, they've gone through a weekend almost from hell. Their Messiah, their King, their hope, their future is hang on the tree like the, the greatest criminal of that time. And eventually died right before their very eyes. And was, it's for sure that he's dead because they even buried him. Everything that their hopes and dreams were built on was shattered to pieces. So they tried to reason. And they were Jewish people who are angry. And when we are angry and we try to reason, we always talk with our hands. So much so they were talking that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. Their eyes were restrained and that they did not know him. And he said to them, what kind of conversation is this that you have with one another as you walk and are what? Sad. Jesus 
the resurrected Lord on Sunday morning, walking with his disciples, not Roman soldiers, not Pharisees, not Sadducees, with his own disciples. And he's asking them, why are you sad? What things? What, are, what, what is this kind of conversation? What is this kind of conversation that you're talking about? What is go Or I will say, what are you talking about, Willis? I mean, I can do it in many other ways. <laughs> But think about it. The Lord Jesus is walking next to his own disciples. And one of them is saying to him, the one whose name was Cleophas, answered and said to him, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem? Look at the attitude, okay? And have you not known the things which happen there in these days? And Jesus, I love it, he says, what things? <laughs> so they said to him, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, who was a prophet. That's it. Past tense. Who was a prophet, mighty indeed, and word before God and all the people. And how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Past tense. That's it. He's gone. He's dead. No hope. No dream. Nothing. They tell Jesus about Jesus. And indeed, now you would think that they were there only for the crucifixion. You would think that that's why they're so sad. They never heard about what's happened next. But look, they're telling him now about his resurrection. Indeed, beside all these things, today's the third day since these things happened. Yes, certain women of our company who arrived at the tomb early astonished us. That means they were in the upper room with all the other guys while the women went early, found out that he's dead, ran back to tell the guys he is alive. So the women came to us. And when they did not find his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Now I'm telling you that was their face. And I'm telling you, that was the face of Peter also. The Bible said when he saw the tomb empty, he went back perplexed. No dancing, nothing. And certain of those who were with us went to the tomb. Like not all of them, just few. I would think that all the guys would start running. No, only few. And they, were, they went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said. But him they did not see. It's like, well, the women were right. And then Jesus is looking at them. You, you, you just told me about my death and about my resurrection. I'm talking to you right now. I'm standing right by you right now. And he's looking at his own disciples and he's telling them, oh foolish ones and slow of heart to believe in what all that the prophets have spoken see that's the problem we love to pick and choose what fits us from scriptures and the rest we leave it inside because it doesn't fit the narrative of our mindset The disciples of Jesus did not believe in his resurrection. The disciples who were in the upper room, not just some others who may have heard and maybe secretly believed. This is us, they said, who were together. Some of us went to the grave, went to the tomb. They were sad on Sunday morning. They were not just sad, they were embarrassed, they were angry, they were confused. And he said to them, you know what your problem is? 
You've been coming to synagogues every Shabbat. You've heard every word written, and you just never truly believed. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in what? All scripture. All the scriptures, the things concerning himself. And bear in mind, he never really went with them through the New Testament. <laughs> Sorry. Jesus never quoted the New Testament even once. Paul never quoted the New Testament. In fact, Jesus was not even a Christian. How can the Christ be the follower of Christ? Jesus, if I lead tours to Israel and I take them through different places and a lady came to me and said, so I'm confused, was Jesus Orthodox or Catholic? And I said, I'll confuse you even more, he was a Jew. And they drew near to the village where they were going and he indicated that he would have gone farther, but they constrained him saying, abide with us. You see, once you understand the word of God, once you read and once you believe, once you see it had to have happened, things must happen, then you understand it's part of a greater thing. And I know the end of the story. And he went in to stay with them. Now it came to pass that he sat at the table with them. He took the bread, blessed it, broke it, gave it to them. The Bible says their eyes were open and they knew him and he vanished from their sight. Like gone. First, you know, it, it's a rapture, but sideways. <laughs> and he was gone. And they looked at one another and said, ah, that's too weird. No! The Bible says, they looked at one another and they said to one another, did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us on the road and while he opened the scriptures to us? So they rose up. You would think that it's too dangerous. It's nighttime. They're far from Jerusalem. You would think that they would at least they would stay the night. No. <laughs> when they heard that their Redeemer lives, they wanted to be the first ones to tell all of those that are mourning in the upper room in Jerusalem that he is alive. <laughs> so they took themselves, they didn't even wait, and they were on their way back to Jerusalem, no more confused, no more embarrassed, no more angry, no more sad, full of the Spirit, on their way, knowing that their Redeemer lives. They come all the way to the upper room and they said, we've got something to tell you. And everybody said, we know. <laughs> we know. He was here too. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, if we do not know the scriptures or we believe only some and we pick and choose what we want, we will never be able to walk with confidence. We will never be able to walk with, with, with assurance. We will be tossed with the wind and when difficulties will come and trust me they had difficulties in the first century when difficulties come we will be set on it i mean if we don't know the scripture if we don't understand if we don't believe those look it's i, I must i must admit if i was a jew who grew up in the first century i would have it also hard to believe that he rose on the third day because nobody taught me that. I've heard from all the rabbis that the Messiah will come riding a horse. He will reign and rule and that's it. Nobody told me that his first coming is actually to save me from myself, not from the Romans. Nobody told me that he's actually coming riding on a donkey, not on a horse. Nobody told me that he's going to die on the cross for my sins. And nobody told me that he is going to resurrect. Nobody told me, although it was there. And Jesus said, don't listen to people, listen to the word of God. It has been there, it was there. If you only read and believed, 
listened and believed, he would have known that. So when we come to deal with the prophetic timeline of Israel, it's not that I'm coming to ask prophets from among us, what do you think is going to happen to Israel? No, I don't even need your opinion. In fact, I don't care about your opinion. Not because I don't love you. It's because your opinion means nothing. We already know what's going to happen. There is a prophetic timeline prescribed in the word of God. All we need to do is to believe. (laughs) All we need to do is take it in consideration when we look at things and not get too excited about the wrong things and completely apathetic about the important things. It all goes back in the past to the seed It starts with the first sin. It starts with that rebellion of mankind in the Garden of Eden. Because when God created the world, it was very good. And we all know that the first ever prophecy given in the entire Bible was not to man, not to the woman, but to the serpent. And the Bible says that the Lord told the serpent, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head. You shall bruise his heel. You are no match to him. To the seed of the woman. Last time I checked, women don't have seed. They have eggs. Unless they had a seed not from the man, but from the Holy Spirit. And so we come to the point where between chapter 3 and chapter 6, we just... Boom. We, the whole world became impossible. You think this is evil right now? Right now it's paradise compared to what the world was in chapter 6 of the book of Genesis. The Bible says that the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Every only continually. There's nothing good there. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on earth. And he was, he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth. Both man and the beast, creeping things and birds of the air. For I am sorry that I have made them. Thankfully, God was looking. Okay, is there any reason for me to... Keep them to bless something. Is there anything good in this world? But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And thankfully, Noah was there entering that ark. And uh, the human race was saved. But then you think that people learned the lesson? Of course not. In Genesis 15... The Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, indeed, the people are one and they all have one language. Look, globalism didn't start yesterday. From the first attempt of mankind to come together with one language, look at what they did. Now nothing that they purpose to do will be withheld from them. Come, let us go down and there confuse their language that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of all the earth and they ceased building the city. Therefore, its name is called Babel. Say Babel. Babel is Babylon. It's Babel. I mean, Babel, all of your names. I'm not sure what happened to guy that translated the Bible, but when it comes to names, stick to the Hebrew, you'll understand it better. Babel means confusion, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of all the earth. This is the genealogy of Shem, and we see all the way until we get to Abraham. Now, listen. There's two things that people get wrong about Israel. One is that Israel has been replaced by the church, which is wrong. 
The church is here and Israel is here. No one replaced no one. But the other one is that Israel will remain a separated nation unto God for eternity. It's another misconception of Israel. And you'll see why towards the end of the message. So when did God's choosing of Israel truly begin? We know that when Abraham was called to get out of his country. By the way, Abraham was not given any choices here. What do you want? Williamson County? Uh, what do you want? Canada? Canaan? No. Get out of your country. <laughs> from your family and from your father's house and the land. Go to the land that I will show you. And I will make you a great what? Nation. And I will bless you and make your name great. And you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you. And I will curse him who curses you. And in you, in that nation that is going to come out of you. In who you are and the nation that I will bring out of you. All the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now remember, Israel did not exist in early in Genesis. It, it wasn't after, until after the flood and the Tower of Babel that God called out a nation for himself. Israel only entered the scene via Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. After sin has already entered the world, Israel was not chosen from the onset of creation. It would be through Abraham and his descendants that God will make himself known to the world. And Abraham, of course, in Genesis 17, God said to Abraham, as for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. And I will bless her and also give you a son by her. By her. And then I will bless her and she shall be a mother of nations kings of peoples shall be from her and then abraham fell on his face and what laughed god is speaking to you and you're just laughing and he's laughing why because he's looking at his wife then he's looking at himself and then he he realized that's funny a son from us will help you, God. Will help you. Don't worry. We'll have a son. It's going to be for me. But we'll make things work. So it will make sense. Because. <laughs> and he said, Sarah who is 90 years old, bear a child? <laughs> and Abraham said to God, Oh, you mean Ishmael. That Ishmael might live before you. Then God said what? No. God is not heavy of hearing. He's not, he doesn't have some problems. He, he said Sarah. He meant Sarah. And you're not telling me Hagar because I meant Sarah. And you don't give me Ishmael. That's fine. Ishmael, I will bless him. But I meant that a son will come out of Sarah. You're, and you shall call his name Isaac. And I, God, will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant. And with his descendants after him. God said, don't be confused. There is a lineage through which I am going to bless the whole world. Through which I am going to communicate myself through the whole world. And it's not through Ishmael. Then came Isaac. And the gene genealogy of Isaac, Abraham's son, Abraham begot Isaac. Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah as his wife, the daughter of Betuel, the Syrian of Padan Aram, the sister of Laban, the Syrian. Now Isaac pleaded with the Lord for his wife because she was barren. And the Lord granted his plea and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. But the children struggled together within her and she said, if all is well, why am I like this? 
So she went to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb. Two peoples shall be separated from your body. One people shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. Foretold. And in Genesis 32, we know that Abraham gave Isaac and Isaac gave Jacob. And Jacob is now about to cross the river Yabok. And we know that the Lord said, I will not let you go unless you... No, Jacob told the Lord, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. And the Lord said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked, saying, tell me your name, I pray. Amazing. They did not know his name. This is why... When Moses was sent to the children of Israel, he said, okay, it's fine. I'll go and tell them about you, but what am I going to tell them? Who are you? What's your name? God spoke to Moses and said to him, I am the Lord. I appear to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty. But by my name, Lord, I was not known to them. I've also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land of their pilgrimage in which they were strangers. And I have also heard the groaning of the children of Israel whom the Egyptians keep in bondage. And I have remembered my covenant. Therefore say to the children of Israel, I am the Lord. I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will rescue you from their bondage. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgment. And I will take you as my people and will be your God. The four I wills that are making the four cups of wine on Passover every year. Then came Joshua and we know what happened with him. And then came the King David. God continues. God promised. God is establishing his covenant. God is faithful to his word, to his promises, no matter what circumstances are. And then came Solomon. You would think that Solomon is the last person God is going to have as the king of Israel, being the person who is the son of Bathsheba. No, Solomon said to the Lord, you have shown great mercy to your servant David, my father, because he walked before you in truth, in righteousness, and in uprightness of heart with you. You have continued this great kindness for him, and you have given him a son to sit on his throne as it is this day. And now, Lord, my God, you have made your servant king instead of my father, David, whom, but I am a little child. I do not know how to go out or or come in. And your servant is in the midst of your people whom you have chosen, a great people, too numerous to be numbered or counted. And therefore give to your servant an understanding heart to judge your people that I may discern between good and evil for who is able to judge this great people of yours? They're yours. They're your problem, by the way. Moses said, these people, it's not mine, it's yours. So if you want me to leave them, you go before me. I'm not moving out. Moses had an attitude. He said to the Lord, unless you lead, I'm not moving. (laughs) Then came the prophets. And one after the other, these are not people who went to school of prophets. They're not people who are called prophet this or prophet that. These are people who actually ran away from what God wanted them to do. These are people who suffered greatly because God spoke through them. These are people, look, and Isaiah, look, and God is very clear. He wants everyone, all of you here and all of you back home, he wants you to know his future. 
The Bible says, remember the former things of old. For I am God, there is no other. I am God, there is none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning. And from ancient times, things that are not yet done. There's a city called Damascus. It is still standing until today with millions of people living in it. Yes, some of it is destroyed because of the, of the civil war over there. But it's a bustling city and it's still standing. And it, has, it still has some traffic and people and commotion and animals. And the Bible says that Damascus will not be inhabitable anymore. It will be completely destroyed. God says the time will come. God says, I will tell you the end from the beginning and from ancient times. Things that are not yet done. So you can tell me, I don't believe that Damascus will be destroyed. I don't care what you tell me. God said it will be destroyed. Why? Because God says, I am revealing to you for a reason. My counsel to stand, he says. I will do all my pleasures. That's why in Second Peter It says, knowing this first, no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. You know, I'm getting angry right now. <laughs> you know how many people are selling books with false prophecies. And the people of God are duped to buy them. And then when it's not happening, they wait seven, seven years until... Once again, same thing, again and again, and everybody's just drinking from their hand. Because they're telling you their private interpretation. They're taking things out of context. They're not even giving you the, the things that the Bible says that must happen. It's not about private interpretation. For prophecy never came by the will of God, but by the will of man. But holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. They had to be holy men of God and they were moved by the Holy Spirit. It wasn't even their own idea. I, I think that when, when Ezekiel described the war to come or when he described the valley of the dry bones, he had no idea that Israel is going to go through Such a terrible time in Europe. He had no idea. But in his mind, he's seeing what God is telling him. And what God is communicating through him. For not only his generation. But for generations to come. And the greatest and, and, and the most amazing prophecy. Regarding the future of Israel. The prophetic timeline of Israel. Was given to a Jew over there in Babylon called Daniel. And the Bible says, and by the way, just so you know, the book of Daniel, chapter 1 to 6, is from an exiled youth to old age during three different world leaders. And from chapter 7 to 12, it's from the exiled youth to old age during three world leaders as well. But that is the prophetic part of The book. There is historical part and then there is prophetic part. It's not like all 12 chapters are chronologically ordered. And the Bible says, as we, and, and, and as, as we already read, in 1 Peter chapter 1, look what he says. One of my favorite verses. Of this salvation. Peter, he's already a saved Jew. He's already writing to Gentiles. He's telling them, Of this salvation, the prophets have inquired and searched carefully who prophesied of the grace that would come to you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. They wish they could see what we see. They wished they ex could experience the knowledge of the Messiah. In Daniel chapter 9, we see an amazing, amazing revelation of Daniel. 
Now you have to understand, in Leviticus 26, it says, I will bring the land to desolation and your enemies shall dwell in it, shall be, ast- shall be astonished at it. And I will scatter you among the nations and draw out a sword after you. Your land shall be desolate and your cities waste. And then the land shall enjoy its Sabbaths as long as it lies desolate and you are in your enemy's land, he said. Daniel was not in Israel, he was in Babylon, the enemy's land, fulfilling Leviticus's prophecy. And then the land shall rest and enjoy its Sabbaths as long as it lies desolate, it shall rest for the time it did not rest on your Sabbaths when you dwelt in it. And it's amazing. Daniel begins to write chapter 9. And the prophet basically says that he's encouraged by the words of another prophet. Daniel says, in the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerosh, of the lineage of the Medes, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood, not by some... People who went to school of prophecy. Not by some people who had some revelation. I understood by the books. The number of the years specified. By the word of the Lord through who? Jeremiah the prophet. Daniel is acknowledging that God spoke through Jeremiah. And wrote it in a book. And he says... I read in the book and I acknowledge here I am in the land of my enemies and I know that the time ticks, the clock ticks and I know we're about to leave this place. And he's encouraged. He should accomplish 70 years in the desolation of Jerusalem. Exactly what Daniel uh, saw is what Jeremiah wrote in chapter 25. This whole land shall be desolation and an astonishment. And these nations shall serve the king of Babylon. How many? 70 years. When God sets a number, you better believe that number. Jeremiah 29. For thus says the Lord, after 70 years are completed at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word towards you and cause you to what? return to this place. Jeremiah not only wrote the book of Lamentation as he saw the destruction of Jerusalem, but he also wrote about the return of Israel back to the land. And Daniel being in in, in, in Babylon, he believed that. In 2 Chronicles chapter 36, to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah until the land had enjoyed her Sabbath, as long as she lay desolate, she kept Sabbath to fulfill 70 years. So Jeremiah is receiving, excuse me, Daniel is receiving a, a visit from a, an archangel and he's telling him, look, Daniel, you're a good guy. And from the moment you began to to pray, the Lord sent me. <laughs> hey, uh, Gabriel, come over here. Spread your wings and go to Daniel and tell him that I like him, <laughs> <laughs> that I, I see his heart, and I'm giving him a greater vision of a greater portion of all the history of Israel from this point on. He says, it's not going to be, what nation is going to, he's talking about the nation of Israel. He's talking about the city of Jerusalem. See, Bible prophecy, I'm sorry to tell you, I am really sorry. I'm going to apologize thousands of times probably in the next few months. But God does not write about Russia and Ukraine war. God is not writing about China or India or Libya unless they have something to do with his plan. For Israel. The Bible says in the book of Deuteronomy 32, when the Most High divided their inheritance to the nations and when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the boundaries of the peoples according to the number of the children of Israel. For the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is the place of his inheritance. So the key to all prophecies is actually the Jew. 
No, they're not perfect. In fact, <laughs> they're going to suffer for no reason if they only acknowledge Jesus. Only if they could understand. It will spare them from, from going through the, the horrors of the Antichrist. The key to all prophecy is the Jew. If the Jewish nation had not forsaken God and neglected the Sabbath, there would have been no times of the Gentiles. The times of the Gentiles began when God transferred earthly rule from the kings of Israel to the Gentile king Nebuchadnezzar. And then it will continue until Israel again becomes the head of all nations when Jesus is going to reign from Jerusalem throughout the thousand years millennial kingdom. Until the millennial kingdom, the times of the Gentiles are still here. And Daniel received the vision. And in the vision, he saw 70 weeks that have been determined upon Israel. 70 weeks that have been determined, up, determined about Jerusalem. In fact, he is dividing them to 7, 62, and 1. Look at it, and it's amazing. 70 times 7 is 490 years. That's the, the week is basically a cluster of 7 years. Every week is 7 years. And so the Bible says that the prophet Daniel received the vision where there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks from the moment the decree to rebuild Jerusalem and the walls and the temple will be given by the king of Persia. In other words, seven and 62 is 69 weeks. What is the starting point? Daniel 9, from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem. So look at this thing. It's amazing. Seven weeks are 49 years it'll take to rebuild the city. And Nehemiah chapter 2 all the way to chapter 6. Then 62 more weeks. Another 434 years until Jesus entered Jerusalem riding on a donkey. To the day Daniel was accurate. 483 years. It's exactly 173,880 days if you want to calculate. That was it. Sir Robert Anderson wrote a book called The Coming Prince. In which he, he basically realized that the entrance of, Je of Jesus into Jerusalem was on the very day Daniel received that prophecy. April 6, 32 AD. It's quite amazing because that was the week of Passover. That was an amazing time. Jesus rode a donkey. Jesus entered Jerusalem. And we can clearly see the number of days because we know the number of years and the number of each of days in a biblical year. Jewish people go after the lunar calendar, 360 days. Therefore, at 1260 days period is exactly three and a half years. And that is why in Revelation, when it speaks of the first half of the tribulation or the second half of the tribulation, it will always mention also the number of weeks, months, and even days. 1260 days. Revelation 11, leave out the court which is outside the temple. Do not measure it for it has been given to the Gentiles. And they will tread the, the holy city underfoot for 42 months. And I will give power to my two witnesses. And they will prophesy 1,260 days. 42 months. Three and a half years. Amazing. Revelation 12 continues with all of that. And even Revelation 13. So 483 years on the lunar calendar are 476 years on your Gregorian calendar, which brings us all the way to that day Jesus entered Jerusalem in 32 AD. And I would like to show you, I wish it wasn't this, but um, we didn't have time. We didn't know the dimension of this screen. But look at this, please, and see the different, the different way for me to, to show you the vision that Daniel received and the future 
of Israel all the way. Take a look at it. From the time the decree of Artaxerxes to Ezra, in Ezra chapter 7, all the way to the rebuilding of Jerusalem that took seven weeks, 49, 49 years of course, all the way to the 62 weeks of the history until Jesus had the triumphal entry into Jerusalem known as the Palm Sunday. And then, of course, after that came the destruction of the temple and Jerusalem by the Gentile, um, by the um, Romans, of course. And thus, the time of the Gentile continues and the church age has begun. So where are we? So as we continue to examine, we see that there was those seven weeks and we talked about it already. And then came the 69 weeks as we talked about it already as well, which is the time until Jesus entered Jerusalem, 62 years, uh, 62 weeks. And then of course, we're coming to the time of the Gentiles the church age, ladies and gentlemen. And now we have to ask ourselves, where are we on this timeline that we just saw? So look at this. Daniel was not talking about you. The prophecy was not about the Gentiles, not about America. The prophecy was about what? Jerusalem and Israel. And he says, there's going to be two things. The time from the moment the decree was given to build the temple until Messiah comes in and is being sacrificed and the temple is destroyed. And there will be another week, the 70th week, that is going to happen in the future. And it is also for the nation of, of Israel and for Jerusalem. He's, 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 he's saying, look, all the weeks, all 70 weeks are for Israel. 69 were for them, as well as the 70th, which will be for them. Because God loves them. God wants their attention. Sometimes some spanking is needed. And I want you to know that Isaiah 66 says that something incredible is about to happen towards the end of, those, of, those, uh, uh, of that gap. Who has heard such a thing? Who has seen such things? Shall the earth be made to give birth in one day? Or shall a nation be born at once? For as soon as Zion was in labor, she gave birth to her children. As soon as the nation of Israel was ready to return back to their land, Zion, Zion is the geographical location. It gave birth to a country overnight. In Matthew 24, after explaining what is going to happen to Israel during the tribulation, that is why he's talking to them about when you see the desolation, the abomination of desolation, pray that it's not going to be on the Sabbath day, pray that it's not going to be in the winter. All of these warnings are for Israel during the tribulation and for the things that are going to happen in the courts of the temple that will be standing in Jerusalem. He's talking to the Jewish people about the future of Israel. But then he makes an amazing pause. And in Matthew 24, in those, in that cluster of verses, he says, he says, learn this parable from the fig tree when its branch has already become tender and puts forth leaves you know that summer is near so you also when you see all these things know that it is near at the doors assuredly I say to you this generation will by no means pass away until all these things take place heaven and earth will pass away but my word will by no means pass away away. If you do not understand Israel, you cannot understand the times and the seasons because we were given the most important peace that will make everything come together so beautifully. There has to have been a physical restoration to the land of Israel. There has to have been something great 
You see, for hundreds of years, Christians, or at least people who call themselves Christians, they saw that the Jews are no longer in their land, no longer speaking their language, no longer having their city, Jerusalem. So they said, ah, God must have replaced Israel with the church. God has forgotten all about Israel. Samuel Langhorn Clemens, known to you as Mark Twain, came to the land in um, 1867 and he published his impressions in Innocence Abroad. He described a desolate country devoid of both vegetation and human population. He, he saw the land and he says, even the cactus that is a great friend of the desert didn't want to live there. Didn't grow there. He said, I couldn't even see one person. They tell us that the Jews came and there was filled with Palestinians. He was there in 1867. He says, I couldn't even find one. Right. It's interesting because look at the quote of Mark Twain. He says in 1881 in London, he says, desolate country whose soil is rich enough, but is given over wholly to weeds a silent, mournful expanse. A desolation is here that not even imagination can grace with the pomp of the life and action. We never saw a human being on the whole route. He said, there was hardly a tree or a shrub anywhere. Even the olive and the cactus, those fast friends of the worthless soil had almost deserted this country. And, and look what the country looked like when the first Jews in the late 1800s started coming. Look, it was dead. You had to have a lot of faith to think that something can come out of it. And this is exactly in Ezekiel 36. Ezekiel saw it and he said, You, O mountains of Israel, shall shoot forth your branches and yield your fruit to my people Israel, for they are about to come and the desert take a look at what happened to the desert that's not the work of listen to me this is to the glory of God not to the glory of the Jews this is to the glory of God because he's a God that fulfills his promises and if G Ezekiel said I'm about to revive the dead land in in preparation for the return of the Jews so he did against all odds but now, how do we bring the people? What is the status of a scattered nation from all over the world? And therefore, in, 18, in 1917, Lord Balfour, on behalf of the, Her Majesty's uh, government, wrote the following thing to Lord Rothschild. He basically said this, I have much pleasure in conveying to you on behalf of His Majesty, uh, government, the following declaration of sympathy with Jewish Zionist aspiration. In those days, to say Zionist wasn't a bad word. Today, they try to tell you that it's a bad word. But in those days, Zionist aspiration means that the Jews belongs to the land of Zion. Any Christian that believes that the Jews should come back to the land of Zion is a Zionist. And anyone who hates them will tell you that Zionism is a bad word and will start conspiracy theories. As if they are over all the world, taking over the whole world. What a rubbish. We, we hardly take over our own neighborhood. Ladies and gentlemen, I, listen, look what he said. The majesty's government with you in favor established, establishment in Palestine of a nation home for the Jewish people. A national home for the Jewish people. And will use their best endeavors to facilitate that achievement and if that's in 1917 in 1920 in the San Remo conference in Italy prime ministers of Britain and France and even of Italy and Japan's ambassador met together and took Balfour's declaration and made it a UN it wasn't UN it was the League of Nations document that is the legal ground for the establishment of a Jewish homeland in the land of Israel and nobody cared in those days. 
Then the British government received the paper and they said, okay, now you have the mandate over Palestine in December 1922. The mandate document formalized the creation of two British protectorates, Palestine to include national home for the Jewish people under direct British rule and Transjordan later on, the Emirate governed semi-autonomously from Britain under the rule of the Hashemite family. And then Ezekiel, the same Ezekiel. We're talking about in the 1920s. There's no Holocaust yet. There's no World War II yet. But the Bible, the prophets, they knew it's coming. You're probably going to say, how did they know? Because the Holy Spirit told them. They were not just so perfect. And the Bible says, when he said to me, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They indeed say, our bones are dry, our hope is lost, and we ourselves are cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God, behold, O my people, I will open your graves, and I will cause you to come up from your graves, and I will bring you into the land of Israel, not Palestine. And he says... Then you shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up from your graves. I will put my spirit in you and you shall live. I will place you in whose land? Your own land, he said. And then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and Britain has done it. No. God said, I take the credit because no one is going to help you. Which dry bones he was talking about? The, the only thing I could come up with is the photo that was taken when the Allied forces came to liberate the camps. You see bones, you see skin, and you see eyes with no hope. And then God says, I'm not done. Not only that I'm going to take you out of that graveyard of Europe, but I... I'm going to bring you back physically to your land and <laughs> from the sea and on the land and the air. I will bring you back from the four corners of the world. And the world will be astonished and they will scratch their head. They will be perplexed and I will take credit for it. But how does a German Jew talk to a Moroccan Jew? <laughs> what exactly is he going to say? And that is why there was a need also to revive the language that was unused and dead for almost 2,000 years. Eliezer ben Yehuda is the one who had the task that is, we can clearly see, is something that the Lord is mentioning in Zephaniah 3, 9, for then I will restore to the peoples a pure language that they all may call on the name of the Lord to serve him with one accord. It's interesting. Last night, two nights ago, I saw 35,000 Jews gathered at the Western Wall. 35,000 Jews chanted together. Have mercy on us, Lord, we have sinned before you. Now, you're saying, are they all saved now? No, no, that, that's a chant every year. On the days between the last month and the beginning of the year, between Elul and Tishrei, right as Rosh Hashanah, the Feast of Trumpets, and Yom Kippur, they meet and they are asking God for forgiveness as a nation. We have sinned before you. Chatanu lefanecha, rachem aleinu. Have mercy on us. Every year, they think that by praying and by fasting and by their good works and good deeds and by some five red heifers, that flew first class from Texas all the way, that they're only one year old. And trust me, most of the disqualification of red heifers happened in the second year. And in 1948, a nation was born. 
God never asked anyone. No one. He said, I'm sorry, it's about time to bring them back. And can a nation be born at once? Yes, it can. 1948. Psalm 126. When the Lord brought back the captivity of Zion, we were like those who dream. He says it was like the streams in the south. There's no streams in the south in Israel. There's only flash floods. Flash floods. Tons of water in a short time. For every Jew that lived in the land, four new immigrants came in a matter of few months. It's like a billion people come to America within five months. Well, it's almost the case. <laughs> Never mind. Okay. <laughs> only a few millions, but... Now, why should it matter for Christians if Jews are returning to Israel? Because this is God in action. Despite the nation's repetitive disobedience, and they're disobedient, God preserved it from the agenda of its enemies time and time again, even up to the War of Independence in 1948. And now we live in 2022, and all of you belong to that generation that can see the fig tree come back to life. The fig tree, by the way, is the symbol of Israel's national privileges. You cannot be part of the fig tree, but you can see the fig tree. Oh, I'm, I'm grafted into the fig tree. No, you're not. You're grafted into the olive tree. You're grafted into the vine. But you're not grafted into the fig tree. The fig, your capital is, is Washington. Your nationality is American. You, but you can see the fig tree. Because you can see Israel is born. Psalm 83, describing the war of independence. How the enemies of God make a tumult. Those who hate God lifted up their head. And they take in crafty counsel against your people. Consulted together against your sheltered ones. They've said, come let us cut them off from being a nation. That the name of Israel will be remembered no more. And that psalm later on describes all the countries we fought against in 1948. But now Israel is in a different place. All of you are witnessing a country that is safe. Ooh, I, I heard that there were rockets flying over there. It is safer than downtown Nashville, trust me. <laughs> Look, the most dangerous part of your Israel tour is overeating. <laughs> or your drive to your airport. Ezekiel 38. Look, Psalm 83, fulfilled. The Spirit is there, but that war is no more. Jordan has peace with Israel. Egypt has peace with Israel. And may I tell you, both countries are now depending on Israel. Why we provide them gas? Not half price. A quarter of the price that Europe is buying gas. They made a good deal. And now, Ezekiel 38, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, set your face against Gog, the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tuval, and prophesy against him, say, Thus the Lord God says, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tuval. And he's saying, Look, I'm going to bring you all the way to and I will add to you, you will see Persia, Iran, Ethiop Ethiopia is, by the way, a wrong, it's actually Sudan in the Hebrew. Kush in Hebrew is Sudan. And Libya, put. Gomer and its troops and the house of Togarma also will join them, which is Turkey of today. A coalition is about to be formed against Israel in the near future. A coalition that will be led by Russia, assisted by Iran, Sudan, and Turkey, and Libya. And they will come predominantly from the north. And that is going to happen in the near future. Whether you like it or not. Look, I'm not happy about telling the people of Israel that a great war is about to come. But we, as a church, must remember every word. Every word is going to come to pass. And now, the latter part, the future, 
is the 70th week of Daniel. The one week of years, seven years, known not just as the tribulation. You guys can call it tribulation, call it whatever you want. The Bible says that it is going to be a time of trouble for Israel. Daniel says, he, the Antichrist, shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. But in the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abomination shall be one who makes desolate even until the consummation, which is determined, is poured out on the desolate. Just like the first 69 weeks, the 70th is all about Israel. And we know that the, the, the Bible says, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? Is God plotting to destroy Israel? No, certainly not through their fall to provoke them to jealousy. Salvation has come to the Gentiles. Now, if their fall is riches for the world and their failure riches for the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? For I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry, that if by any means I may provoke to jealousy those who are my flesh and save some of them. Israel will be saved once the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion." Blindness in part has happened to Israel. Yes, until, say until. Until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved as it is written. The deliverer will come out of Zion and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. But in order for them to be saved... They have to come to the end of themselves and get rid of tradition and get rid of religion and get rid of their dependency on rabbis and rabbinical teachings and everything that is a stumbling block for them from seeing Jesus. Jeremiah 30 says, alas, for that day is great so that none like it. And it is the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. Daniel 12, at that time, Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. Gabriel is telling Daniel about Michael. And he's telling him there is a, an archangel that his job is to watch over your people, Israel. And he says that Michael, he will stand up and there shall be a time of what? Trouble. Such as never was since there was a nation. The Holocaust will pale. Compares to what the Antichrist is going to do to Israel. And he says. Even to that time. And at that time. Your people shall be delivered. Everyone who is found written in the book. What does that mean? That means that you have to be written in the book to be saved. Hosea says, I will return again to my place until they acknowledge their offense. Then they will seek my face. And look what Hosea says. In their affliction, they will earnestly seek me. When Israel will, will be the heart of the tribulation, when they will be attacked by everything, they will understand that rabbis are not the answer, that the oral law has, not, has never been true. They will understand that everything that the written word of God is happening. They will understand that there is a different way and different life and, di and, 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 and different truth. And it's not what they were told all those years. And that's when they earnestly seek me. Zechariah 12 says, and then... I will pour on the house of David, on the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and supplication. And they will look on me whom they pierced. Yes, they will mourn from him as one mourns for his. See, Jesus is going to come back the second time to earth. 
You see, the, the rapture has nothing to do with his second coming to earth. In the rapture, he comes halfway, we go halfway, and he's coming for the church. The second coming, he's coming all the way down to earth with the church. The rapture is Jesus coming for us. The second coming is Jesus coming with us. And the Bible says that when they will look at him, whom they pierce, when Jesus will appear, and the whole world will see. Look, the rapture, nobody will see him beside us. He's in the clouds. We're meeting him in the clouds. <laughs> Twinkling of an eye. <laughs> We're gone. It's not like Mary Poppins upwards. <laughs> nobody will see us going up and try to shoot us down. But in the second coming, the whole world will see Jesus coming. And the whole world will see. And Israel, at that time, I believe, they will be together celebrating the Feast of Trumpets. And as they blow the trumpet, he will come back. And they will see him. And then they will enter into the mode of what? Mourning. Which is which day? Yom Kippur. They will now repent. And then comes the fruit of their repentance, which is now you can enter into the millennial kingdom, which is the fulfillment of the Feast of Tabernacles. All three fall festivals will be fulfilled right at the right span of time between each other at the second coming of Jesus. For us, we don't have to wait for any holiday. Oh, what about Rosh Hashanah? Well, if he has to come and take us on Rosh Hashanah, then any other day of the year is not good. God is neither done with Israel, nor has he replaced them. Malachi says, I am the Lord. I do not change. Therefore, you are not consumed, O sons of Jacob. And I want to show you this. <laughs> From creation to Abraham, there was no Israel. From Abraham to Jesus, predominantly Israel. From Jesus to the end of the millennial kingdom, there is Israel and the church. But then... When God will make all things new, new heaven and new earth and new Jerusalem, the only criteria is no longer Jew or Gentile, Israel or it's those written in the Lamb's book of life. As Revelation 21 says, only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life shall be in that city. There will be no more temple. There will be no more um, need for the sun, the moon, or the stars. That's it. There will be even no behold Israel in the new Jerusalem. You don't have to look at Israel anymore. But some of us will be there, the members. But <laughs> if you want to spend eternity in the presence of the Lord... Whether Jew or Gentile, make sure your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. God is faithful to Israel because he wants you to know that his faithfulness to them is the exact faithfulness to you. And if he canceled his promises to them, how can you be sure that he won't cancel his promises to you? His faithfulness towards them is a picture of his faithfulness to you. There will come the day when there will be no more Israel. Even Jeremiah said, only when there is no moon, nor stars, and no sun, that's when Israel will no longer be a nation before him. That's why I tell the Iranians, the, the mullahs, the ayatollahs, all of your rockets don't aim towards Israel, aim towards the sun, moon, and the stars. Because only when they will no longer exist, then Israel will not exist anymore. And so, Lord, we thank you for the prophetic timeline of Israel that, ex that is a picture of the accuracy, authenticity, and reliability of your word. We thank you for how you deal with them. And now we ask, just as 2 Corinthians chapter 3 says, that only when that veil is on the eyes of the Jews is removed, then they understand the truth. And that veil can only be taken away when they turn to Christ. So we pray for the salvation of Israel. 
And until then, we ask, Father, that you will never cause us to stumble into terrible, diabolic uh, theologies of replacement, of anti-Semitism, and of, of uh, really even idolizing Israel as they are right now. Father, we thank you for the imminency of the rapture, for the soon return of the Lord, any day now, perhaps today, we thank you that we can come together as the children of God, looking at your word, knowing that your word is truth. And we ask you to sanctify us by that truth. And we ask this in the matchless name of the Holy One of Israel, Yeshua HaMashiach. In his name we pray and all of God's people say, Amen. Amen.